Welcome to Retailing to Schools and Libraries, a CBLDF retailer webinar. My name is Holly Dotson. I am the Education Coordinator for Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. CBLDF is a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting the First Amendment rights of the comics art form and its community of retailers, creators, publishers, librarians, and readers. The CBLDF provides legal referrals, representation, advice, assistance, and education and furtherance of these goals. We are a small organization that is directly supported by the contributions of our members and donors. If you can make a monetary contribution, please consider signing up for membership or making a donation for one of our premium items. If you're unable to make a donation or a contribution, you can still help by spreading the word about CBLDF, following us on Twitter and Facebook, and distributing our literature in your community. Again, welcome to uh, Retailing to Schools and Libraries. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the logistics of the webinar and where you can find things. If you move your cursor down to the bottom of your screen, you should have a bar that um, enables you to uh, open the chat and the Q&A. Uh, the chat will be running throughout the webinar. I will be posting um, information about resources from CBLDF um, that are relevant to what our speaker will be talking about. And you can also chime in with any uh, comments or questions that you would have as she's doing her presentation. And then after um, her presentation, we'll also have uh, time for uh, Q&A. So I will introduce our speaker. I'm so glad to have her with us today. Jennifer Haynes is the owner of The Dragon, an award-winning comics and game store headquartered in Guelph, Ontario. She is also Comics Pro Vice President and a member of the Ontario College of Teachers. With over 10 years experience as an educator and extensive knowledge of comics, Ms. Haynes is in a unique position to help comic retailers build a school client base. And so we want to welcome her today. Hello, Ms. Hello. Haynes. Hello. Hey. <laughs> um, I am going to mute myself um, and let... Um, Jennifer take over and again I will be posting things in the chat bar and we will let uh, Jennifer get started. Holly before you go I don't have the chat bar open. Are you okay. open for me or do I need to do um, that? You can if you just again put your uh, cursor down towards the bottom of the screen it should have a, a bar should open up with the. Oh there it is. Yeah. It's on the top as it turns out. Okay. Oh okay. <laughs> it's on the bottom uh, of the Q&A one right? No, it's going to say chattel. It'll um, have a little bubble. Um, oh, there we go. Um, More chat. There we go. I got it. I okay. got it. Awesome. All right. All right. And I can put that wherever. Oh, that's perfect. Okay. Yay. Okay. Yay. All right. So, hello. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining me today. Um, I uh, have lots of information to give you, so bear with me. Ask questions if you need to. Uh, I will absolutely take questions at the end. I've also put my email address there and I'm happy to help you with information uh, following the presentation. Uh, questions are already being asked about uh, sending the presentation out. Uh, and yes, we had talked about sending out the presentation uh, after this to uh, people who have joined the webinar today. So don't worry. All right. If I can get my thing to go, let's try this. Nope, hang on, technical difficulties. There we go, all right. Uh, so to start off a little bit about myself, uh, I opened the Dragon back in 1998, but then I ended up going back to school for a few years uh, and fell into teaching. Um, I got my Bachelor of Education and taught for 10 years. I've taught with graphic novels, specifically uh, Louis Riel, Mouse, and Castle Waiting. Uh, since leaving teaching, I've continued to teach by going into schools and conducting workshops. Obviously, my knowledge of teaching and of comics puts me in a unique position to help you know how to talk to teachers. I'm going to go over what we do with schools, but I'm also going to focus on how to talk to teachers and librarians. My goal is to give you buzzwords that teachers and librarians want to hear and the pedagogically based concepts that will help you convince schools and also parents that graphic novels are a good thing. 
So this is a sort of a summary of our services. I'm going to talk about each one of these things in detail, uh, but we do library consultations. Uh, we do book fairs where we give uh, sales back in free books to the library or school. Uh, we do a Comics for Excellence program. We offer 25% off on all purchases for a school's library or classroom. And I also provide paid workshops. So when it comes to the purchasing part for schools, uh, some boards will require you to be on a specific list that schools can buy from. Some schools care about the list, some schools do not because they know that you're, you have a specialty and you have a unique knowledge. They won't necessarily uh, hold themselves to that list, but it's a really good idea to get on those lists and that's just a matter of calling your local office and finding out what that involves and if you do have to be on that um, eligible vendors list for the board. All right, so a library consultation. I head into a library, I meet with the librarian. I talk about uh, what the goals of the library are. So is the goal to just get kids to read? Uh, is it for literary reading? Are there specific genres they're looking for? Does the school have limitations in terms of their content or specific mandates they'd like to fulfill with the selection? For example, I just filled an order for a school that was really really wanted books about the environment because they have a really environmental mandate. So that was one of the things I made sure to get those books in there. Are there special requests from students? Uh, taking special requests is definitely uh, important. Um, you also need to be aware that a lot of teachers and librarians consult lists of books that they consider to be great for schools. Uh, but most of the time, these lists are full of books that kids aren't actually that interested in reading and are instead interesting to an adult reader looking at them and saying, oh, this kid, this would be good for a kid, but the kids aren't necessarily going to be as into it. Uh, so it's important for you to hold fast to your knowledge about what works as a product and what works for your customers, because that information is the valuable information they're looking for. Uh, so I also offer to go in and meet with librarians in a one-on-one -on -one meeting to sort of help them understand graphic novels, because a lot of the librarians are are unsure about graphic novels. There is a huge number of them who have come into library services recently who are really into graphic novels and get it and are totally like on board, but there are a lot of people who don't have that same understanding. And the libraries that are kind of pushing back against graphic novels, it's mostly because they don't understand. So it's really valuable to offer to be able to go in and talk to them on a sort of a one-on-one -on -one basis and give them the information that they need. Um, I'm gonna elaborate on that a little bit more when we get to our third element, which is convincing the unconvinced. Uh, so call your school district is what I would say. There we go. Holly's already answered it. Holly's going to answer questions for me while I talk. How about that? <laughs> All right. So uh, we do a lot of contact with schools throughout the year. So at the beginning of the year, we send out a mailer. Uh, we make sure to address that to the teacher librarian on staff uh, using their name if we know it. If we just send it to the school, it totally gets lost. If you send it to the principal, it gets lost. Uh, the teacher librarian, that's the person who is working in the library and is sort of controlling all the information flow for the students. That's, that's your greatest ally at the school. So we'd send it directly to them. In that uh, beginning of your mailer, there's a letter introducing ourselves and detailing what they'll find in the package. There's a brochure of our services and also a book fair poster. So if they choose to run a book fair, they already have the poster available. We also put out a monthly newsletter through MailChimp. This lets us stay in touch with schools. It includes some new release highlights, news about what we're doing in the community, a must have for the uh, library, and something with curriculum connections. Most teacher librarians are on a group forum, which is great because they like to share information with each other, uh, but this also means they're gonna share your newsletter. So don't worry if you don't get a ton of signups. I don't have a huge list of people I send the newsletter to directly, but everybody ends up receiving it in the boards I work with because they share it amongst each other. Last year, so in the 2017-2018 school year, I actually didn't send out the newsletter and I noticed a huge difference in how many book fairs and workshops I booked. This year, as soon as I sent out the first newsletter, I was working on three purchase orders and I had booked two workshops within a week of sending it out. So that contact is definitely beneficial. And each time, each time I send out a newsletter, I end up getting contacted by another school or librarian asking for me to do work for them. Uh, we do a regular newsletter for our customers and it is different from this one. So this one is particularly targeted to what I think would be beneficial for a library and is really looking at 
here's great books that are going to turn well or great books that your teachers are going to love because they have curriculum connections and sort of trying to fulfill the things that librarians are already looking for. Uh, we also have a dedicated page on our website that shows our services. So if a school goes to the website, they can see it there. Uh, I mean school year when I say beginning of the year. Thank you. Good question. All right. Uh, so book fairs. So we provide uh, book fairs for free because we get to sell books and we get exposure for the business. So I don't charge the schools to let me put on a book fair. Uh, I love to do book fairs for two days. It's way more useful than only one day because like almost almost regularly the kids will forget to bring money on the first day and they'll wish they brought money. So if you're there for two days and they can remember on the second day and bring their money and everyone is a lot more happier. Uh, we do all the setup and all the takedown for the book fair. And uh, this is great for librarians. Oh, most people are familiar with Scholastic. Scholastic does book fairs all around the, the continent. Uh, and librarians have to do all the work. They have to set it up, take it down, take all the payments. So we do all that for them, uh, which they do really appreciate. We put out the books by genre, and a, we provide a specific selection of single issues as well. Uh, we also usually take some non-comic merchandise, things like blind boxes, mini comic packs, small games. Uh, it's just to provide a real range of items for customers and also provides a range of price points because some kids may show up with $2 and you want to be able to fill something for them. So having, you know, single issue comics, that helps you out. In terms of how many uh, copies of each book we bring, it kind of varies depending on the book. So there's certain books like Raina Telgemeier, Dogman, which we're bringing uh, stacks of books for that. So anywhere from like usually around like six copies of each of those books. Other books we're bringing one to two copies. And it's not all of our selection of kids books, but rather ones I I know from experience tend to sell better and turn faster. Uh, and that's based on store sales, but also based on book fairs. Having a two day book fair also means that you have the ability to restock between days and also to take requests on the first day if it's something you don't have. Um, I stopped taking manga to book fairs actually, and that's worked out quite well for me, uh, which may be surprising. Um, but what I found was that I couldn't fulfill the desire for manga at the book fairs. So I couldn't actually bring what anybody was looking for. You know, I could, I could, I would have to literally bring the entire run of Naruto to get that one kid who wanted that one volume of Naruto. So it wasn't really worth the amount of packing and the amount of space it would take up on the tables for that group of kids who want that one specific book when the chance of me bringing one specific book was kind of slim. Uh, I do have a list of books that I feel work best at the fairs, and I am happy to share that information. Uh, we make sure to be able to take debit and credit at these book fairs. Uh, that's really valuable for people. So uh, the software or the hardware, I guess, for this is really great now. Like Square has an amazing machine that will do everything for you. It's wonderful. Uh, and at the end of the book fair, I add up the sales and I allow the library to pick 10% out of 10% uh, of retail in retail value from the selection remaining, or I can put together a list for them after the fact. I also include tax in the sales. Uh, it's just easier for the kids. So it's kind of like setting up at a convention. So you like, you can subtract out your tax afterwards and submit it. Um, but it's just, it just incentivizes people to buy. Kids ha are, have a hard time with tax. I, I can understand, you know, we all have a hard time with tax. <laughs> uh, this year, we're also giving schools the option to send their school population into the store on a given day. Uh, they would identify themselves as being from that school and 10% of the sales made from those customers would go back to the school in the form of books and games. So it's kind of like a, a mobile book fair, if you will, so they can come and do fundraising that way as well. Comics for Excellence. All right, so this is a, a program we provide every year at the end of the school year. We send out this poster uh, in an end of year mailing, which is going out uh, next week. This details our services again and uh, talks about, you know, hey, next year, I'm, I'm here for you, whatever you need, so that when teachers are thinking over the summer about what next year looks like, that we are there in the back of their minds. And if they have some leftover money to spend at the end of the year, this is the time they're gonna do it as well. So Comics for Excellence rewards uh, students who get 
ease in their learning skills. Um, admittedly, I don't know what other report cards look like uh, too deeply outside of the Ontario report card, but in Ontario, we assess learning skills as well as grades. So um, I know there are stores that do comics for A's. So if you get an A on a in a class, then you would get a free comic for each A on your report card. But the learning skills, they assess things like working in a group, punctuality, risk-taking, communication, leadership, all of the life skills that you hope that kids are gaining throughout their school careers. So this rewards students who are maybe not academically strong, but who demonstrate skills which are gonna be applicable in real world circumstances. For me as a teacher and as a parent, these are far more valuable skills. Kids can't necessarily improve their academic standing, but they can improve their ability to listen, for example. This will be our fourth year doing this, and each year it has gotten bigger and bigger. Um, last year, we had a number of people tell us that their kids actually worked harder to get more ease because they knew they'd get free comics at the end of the year. So now we're increasing the value of comics to both parents and teachers, and that's really kind of what all of this is about. We do, uh, for our free books, we use Free Comic Book Day and HDF books, but we also uh, will just go through our kids' single issue shelves and just pull comics off uh, and give them away at that point. Because if they've been on the shelf a really long time, say like a few months or so, they're probably not gonna be bought anyways. So I would rather give them away and put them in the hands of kids who are gonna love them and build on this like community spirit and reputation uh, than have them sit on my shelf for any longer. All right, so I do workshops for schools. I charge $100 an hour. Uh, and additional fees if I have to travel outside of the city. I asked to do them for grade three and up because younger than grade three, they tend to be a little bit too squirrely to sit through a presentation. It's about a 45 minute presentation. Um, and so that $100 is like kind of for each workshop block. So a 45 minute block to an hour, basically. Um, the ideal is groups of no more than 30 students. This, the workshop that I run is about the literary content of comics. There's lots of different ways to do workshops. You could do a workshop on how to draw comics if you have those skills. Uh, you could go in and talk about the business of comics and I've definitely done those as well. But the one that I come back to over and over and the one that schools really want is this one where I, I go in and really talk about why comics are awesome and point out all the amazing things that they can do. Uh, this workshop gets kids to talk about comics in a deeper way than their teacher expects. So we are actually analyzing graphic novels. We're actually looking at the visuals and how the words and pictures go together, how the panels are transitioning from one to the other. And all of a sudden you're getting their teachers to see that they're not just reading these books for fun, but they're actually taking in all this amazing information. And yes, graphic novels can be used for book reports and they can be used for projects. Um, it's amazing the number of times that I will be looking out at my audience and I watch a teacher have that light bulb moment where they go, oh my gosh, this kid isn't reading, isn't just like reading comics because they're easy. This kid is actually getting something out of this. Um, it's pretty cool. I often get also teachers coming up to me and mentioning that they had kids in that, in my presentations who spoke for the first time that passionately or that much. These are kids who don't actually participate, but they participated in this graphic novel workshop. And so for them, they can see that value. So being able to go in and spread that value to their teachers is just invaluable. I do about 10 workshops a year. Uh, and that goal is really to create new comic readers and to convince teachers that comics are worthwhile. So for elementary schools, I do a presentation on bone. Uh, and in high school, I use six books which have varying styles and subject matters. Those, those six books, in fact. <laughs> uh, I teach them about closure uh, by getting them to stand up and act out a page. And then based on Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud, we talk about the word picture combinations, panel transitions. I have a slide for each of the types and we talk about additional things on each page such as character, mood, foreshadowing, and more. So at the elementary level, I don't use the actual language in Understanding Comics. Uh, but at the high school level, I do use that language. So if teachers want to integrate uh, graphic novel discussions into their classes, then they can do things like test the students on their uh, recall of those different things, their ability to identify the different types of uh, panel transitions and word picture combinations. When I taught with graphic novels, that is part of what we did. So part of their 
uh, assessments of their understanding of the book would be their understanding of how the book was put together as a, you know, a graphic novel itself. I also have a presentation which I do on the history of comics, which is which is really cool because it's actually a discussion on how comics reflect history. It is it turns out being a secret history lesson for kids. They uh, they all of a sudden are learning about history that they ignored before because it just wasn't that interesting. History is one of my teachables, and throughout my uh, my teacher education, it was always made really clear that the best way to get kids to learn history is to give them something tangible that they can like actually understand in the context of their lives. So giving them comics and giving them something that is like physically they can see and they can see the reflection of the time they came from, that makes history come much more alive for the kids. And so teaching history with comics is actually a really cool way to do it. I also do summer camps. So summer camps I do for free. Uh, this is because most camps have no money to spend. And it's also just a good community initiative that allows me to advertise for free as well. I usually take free comics and give them out to the kids. Uh, because camps are intrinsically more active, I do a different sort of workshop. So in this workshop, kids create superheroes. We talk a little bit about real world injustice and how a superhero could help fix problems they see in their community. Uh, and then the kids work together as a team and, and create individuals and an overarching team that's designed to fight against some sort of real world uh, injustice. They color in a black lined figure that's provided for them, which you can see on the slide there, uh, and create a costume. And then they share their creations and we have another follow up discussion about uh, comparing superheroes with real life heroes and they, they all get to come away with the conclusion that everyone can be a hero. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about how to talk to teachers and librarians. Uh, so benefits of reading comics in the classroom. Let's see if you can get the slide to work for me. Oh, come on. There we go. Uh, so this is general knowledge. Teachers totally get that uh, it attracts reluctant readers and English language learners. The reason is uh, two part. For one, the text is broken into manageable chunks. So teachers learn to basically two ways to help struggling readers. This is one of them. It's called chunking. When you take a text and you break it into chunks and you have the readers learn those individual or read those individual chunks one at a time. Uh, the other method is scaffolding. So scaffolding is providing images that support the vocabulary. Graphic novels do both of these things absolutely naturally. So not only do we have the pictures that go along with the text, but you've got the text that's broken into speech bubbles and thought bubbles and narration bars and all of that. So there's these small manageable chunks for the students. However, there's, there's a bit of a stigma around comics that you know they're not real books, but that works also for the English language learners and reluctant readers because they're not intimidating like a so-called real book. You know, it's not a wall of text. There's more visual stimulation. There's more fun. There's more. Um, there's just more feeling of it not being terrifying. All these things together lead to confidence. So. When those students are taking these texts that are naturally chunked and naturally have scaffolding and are not intimidated, then they start reading more and more because they realize that they can. They're having these small victories. Every time they read one of those text boxes, they have a small victory that says, oh, I can do this. And they go on and read the next one. And before they know it, they've read an entire graphic novel. And that just confidence is the number one thing to get kids to read more. It's just being confident in their abilities. So the stigma, right? There are traditional arguments against comics. One is that the reading level is lower. This is actually not true. According to a read aloud specialist, Jim Trulace, in a study from 2001, in order to become proficient readers, people need to master a set of about 5,000 rare words that appear infrequently in conversation. In the average adult novel, these words appear 52 per 1,000 words of text. In comic books, they appear 53 times per 1,000 words. So consequently, comic books don't reduce the vocabulary demand on young readers, but they do provide picture support, quick and appealing storylines, and less text. The next one is that they avoid, uh, they lead to avoidance of real books. 
uh, as far back as 1981 in an article titled Spider-Man at the Library uh, in the School Library Journal, a study proved that the mere presence of comic books in a collection increased library use by 82% with a 30% increase in the circulation of non-comic book material. This is because you've got a bunch of people who are now much more confident in their reading and so they're interested in reading more things beyond comics. The other one is they lack substance. Well, that can be disproven by uh, helping them understand the amazing content, showing them examples of how to read a graph novel, showing them ways that color can establish mood, showing them foreshadowing, showing them how you can read a character's, uh, read, figure out someone's character without even having words on the page. Uh, there's so much that you can analyze in comics, and that's you know, part of what I do in my workshop. Often they will still be not convinced after these things. However, there's lots more ways in which graphic novels are amazing. They can be used to help kids understand sequencing. This is a, one of the first things that uh, kids are taught in kindergarten is to sequence items. They need to know what the uh, first thing is, the middle thing and the end thing. And often they are put into, uh, they're given tasks to sequence items or sequence images. Uh, so graphic novels automatically do that. They teach sequencing. They teach uh, with the panel breakdowns, which help them ingrain this concept of things happening one after another. Analysis of graphic novels can appeal to academic and gifted kids. They can do this analysis and it gives them something outside of the box to work on, which is generally what propels those students to greater success. The activation of more than one part of the brain at the same time is something all teachers strive for in their activities. And so having a combination of words and pictures is activating the vocabulary side, but also the image side of the brain. It develops visual literacy. This is extremely important in a world that is being controlled more and more by corporations and their advertising. Students being able to articulate what's happening in comic in imagery will help them understand the images that are being fed to them by the media, and that's fantastically valuable. Comics also help kids with autism who learn visually. So comics allow kids to make sense of emotions and social situations at their own pace. One of the greatest stumbling blocks for kids with autism and especially kids with Asperger's is being in a social situation they don't understand and they can't process in that moment how to react or how to, um, how to navigate what's happening. With graphic novels, they get a chance to look at how it's happening. They can look at it at their own pace. They can sort of analyze it and figure out how it can relate to them so that when they're in a similar social situation, they have greater tools to deal with that particular situation. And we talked a little bit about uh, how history-based graphic novels can be really great for history classes. Uh, Nonfiction graphic novels like Mouse can be excerpted for classes studying World War II. Uh, I did this in my class and it was amazing how much more value they got out of the studies of World War II when they had something that was just a lot more uh, appealing to them, a lot more visually striking than looking at like even photos from the battlefield. Didn't, didn't have the same impact as reading the story in a graphic novel and reading somebody's firsthand account. All right, so let's talk a bit more about the analysis of graphic novels and what teachers can do with them. In general teaching practice, we are taught that activities should tap into multiple levels of Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, the higher levels are most desirable in most activities. So Bloom's taxonomy uh, was, is a, this pyramid basically that was created uh, to indicate the different types of learning that can take place. And teachers are generally taught that you want to tap into the top layers of Bloom's taxonomy uh, and have some tasks that are, are in the bottom layers, but the majority of your tasks should be top layer items. Most teachers believe that you can only tap into the bottom layer of Bloom's taxonomy, which is really just recalling facts and basic concepts, or maybe two layers. Uh, they believe that the only thing they're good for is book reports, which generally tend toward the recall elements of, of reading. However, you can show librarians and teachers that we use all levels of Bloom's taxonomy when reading and discussing comics if you ask the right questions. Uh, so, for example, uh, you can obviously produce new or original work by creating your own 
uh, graphic novel, creating your own comic. Justifying a standard decision is great. You can have debates about things, uh, drawing connections between different graphic novels, drawing connections between graphic novels and prose or graphic novels and history, uh, and applying information in new situations. You can easily take uh, information learned in uh, a graphic novel and then talk about it in the context of your own personal life, for example. So some comic study activities, uh, creative writing assignments, obviously, uh, what happens next, character biographies, character diaries, news reports, alternate endings, uh, creating your own comic and doing in-character performances. These are all a variety of activities that will engage multiple intelligences. If students protest about doing their own comics because of their artistic skills, well, they can use photographs or even stick figures. The key component here is to demonstrate their understanding of how sequencing works in comics, how the words and pictures go together. So uh, you can basically make a comic in a wide variety of ways, but having kids do that creative work taps into those higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. And that's honestly, uh, when we are required to design activities for students, it is, it has to hit multiple, uh, multiple levels of Bloom's taxonomy. It can't just be about knowledge. It's got to be about knowledge and analysis and creativity. So comics are amazing for that. So this is another buzzword, uh, multiple intelligences. Um, there's a theory that most teachers subscribe to, but not all, uh, that students learn in a variety of ways. So the idea here is that uh, there's different learning styles. The fact of the matter is that most kids probably have multiple of these learning styles. They have multiple, multiple intelligences. Um, I, for example, am totally a verbal linguistic learner. I learn best if I write things down, uh, but there are other people who learn best by getting up and acting them out. Those are the bodily kinesthetic learners. Activities such as comic creation can actually engage all intelligences. We are taught at Teachers College to devise activities that tap into a variety of intelligences in order to give more students the opportunity for success. So when we're creating assignments, we are uh, told to create different ways for students to achieve the same requirements of the class in order for them to show their abilities to, uh, to meet the expectations of the curriculum. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned, verbal linguistic learners learn best through words and language. So most comics and graphic novels will require the use of language to tell a story. Uh, and so in creating a work, students can focus on what the characters say and think. Visual spatial learners learn best through visual elements in producing artistic and design work. Comics must include pictures, obviously. You can't really, you can't even tell a story without words. You can even tell a story without words, but not without pictures. Uh, so placing characters in sets and backgrounds uh, encourages spatial learning as well. The logical mathematical learners learn best when working with numbers or strategy. Comics have a long history of formalism, which has always involved the mathematical arrangement of panels. So devising a plot involves the use of logic and strategy. Bodily kinesthetic learners learn best by movement. So in creating a comic, they could pose people as live models or even get up and move around and act out a comic. Um, those students reluctant to draw can use photography and position models as the characters. Interpersonal learners learn best when working in a group and producing work involving emotions. Intrapersonal learners learn best when self-reflecting and applying their own emotions to the situation, so they're going to be making those autobiocomics. Naturalistic learners learn best when relating things to their own environment. They're going to incorporate details about the character's physical environment and how it relates to the action of the story. They can also use photography to generate backgrounds as they move their characters from one location to another. And musical rhythmic learners learn best when using music or rhythmical patterns. Comics inherently have rhythm throughout the repetition of panels or elements of panels. This is probably the hardest one to execute, I would say, uh, but definitely um, I would say applying sound effects into a comic is one way that those musical rhythmic learners gain the ability to tap into their particular intelligence. So, I mean, really what I'm, what I'm saying here is that making a comic taps into all your multiple intelligences. So having that as a cumulative task for students is a fantastic way to wrap up a comic unit or really any unit at all. Uh, it allows the students to get to those high levels of Bloom's taxonomy and tap into multiple intelligences. And these are things that teachers are looking to do with their students. All right, so when I start working with librarians who want to understand graphic novels or 
when I'm doing my workshop, we actually start about talking uh, about how you read a comic. This sounds really basic, but honestly, the biggest stumbling block for most teachers and librarians is they don't actually understand how to read a graphic novel. They look at the page and they just get lost. And for all of us, I mean, this is just a normal thing that we do on a daily, possibly hourly basis. But for them, it's actually really intimidating. So uh, I start by uh, pointing out that uh, how speech bubbles work. So they tell us three things. One, who is speaking. So wherever that little line goes, tells you who's doing the dialogue. What they're saying, obviously, is what's in the box and also sometimes how they're saying it. So in this particular speech bubble, we've got a larger font. We've got the shape of the speech bubble that's creating sound, the exclamation mark. All those things go to providing a, a, a sonar context to the speech bubble. It's not just what they're saying and who is saying it. Uh, and then obviously, sorry, I'm just going to go back. Uh, and then we talk about how to read it going across from left to right and down into the next box. And I really just lay it out for them. Like, here's how you go from one, one speech bubble to another. Here's how you read it. So talking a little bit about uh, the different types of transitions, that first page there on the left uh, is a moment to moment transition. And we ask, you know, how much is going on in this scene? What's the effect of that panel that has no dialogue? How does that make the reader feel? The one in the middle, what about a page with no dialogue at all? What do we learn about the character? What's the passage of time here? Um, often when I do this page with students, they will all pretty much come up with the same answer, which is that, you know, lots of time has passed. He's, he's adventurous, he's risk taking. There's a lot of information to be gleaned from this page, uh, even though there is no dialogue. And that last one, the one on the right there, that's one of my favorite pages of all time. Uh, it's an absolutely amazing page. And I always point out that this is uh, this shows you what comics can do that basically no other medium can do. Movies can't do it, TV can't do it, but comics can do this. This is three different scenes going on at once. They're all localized in the same spot. However, they're different parts of it. The first is the experience of the girl as the, as the uh, viewer moves closer and closer to her eyes. What is she feeling? What is she seeing? Then you have the experience of the village. You can see that there are shadows in the background. You can hear what they're saying, but you can't actually see what they're doing. You have to extrapolate that uh, you know, as you read it as the reader. Uh, and then behind that, you have the approach of the rat creatures and you can see their eyes and their claws and whatnot getting closer. You don't have to have a huge scene showing the battle. This is all that you need for this one page. It's pretty, pretty darn amazing. Um, one of the things I like to talk about with students and with librarians is that when you read a comic, you actually are co-creating the comic with the creator because you have to really, in your mind, see how it transitions from one panel to another. You have to figure that out. And so that's why I mentioned earlier, one of the things I do is get the kids up to act out a page so they can actually see that there's action happening in the gutters between the panels. Um, and it's, so as a result, you know, a lot of what happens in a comic is, is in your own mind. And really as a result, everyone who reads a comic is gonna read it slightly differently, which is really cool. You all know comics are cool. <laughs> all right, so on this two page, uh, we have a bunch of different things going on. We've got some mood. Uh, we've got the use of color, the difference between bones, candle on the one page and the fire of the rat creatures on the other page. We've got the raging fire that's orange versus the quiet glow of the candle on the left-hand side. Uh, we've got in that bottom panel there on the left, uh, it, I always ask kids um, what, the, what it feels like and if they can't answer that right away, we talk about, uh, like, what time is it? And they always say it's the middle of the night. And what's the temperature? It's freezing cold. And is it quiet or is it noisy? It's always really quiet. Uh, so they get that. Everyone gets that from that panel. Uh, and so it's really great to create the mood that is then uh, in contrast with what's happening on the next page. And so this page is creating some foreshadowing to what's going on with the rat creatures meeting. We talk about why the rat creatures are meeting, how we know that they're trying to get up to no good, what, what their purpose is in that valley. So we also look at uh, color, the use of color and how it can affect the story, uh, the use of non-traditional panel layouts, the use of font, the style of speech bubbles, and how all of these elements can go into uh, developing the story. Obviously, these two books are high school level, and so are the next ones I'm going to look at. Uh, but this is also when you're talking to librarians and trying to get them to see what you see, showing them examples of things like this that will like basically 
uh, break down their preconceptions about what a comic or a graphic novel is, or just, you know, any page from a Chris Ware book, which will usually blow their minds, which is amazing. Uh, you really want to get through to them that the comics medium is not just about easy reading. It's about something so much more. It's about art. Uh, so on these pages, uh, we've got a bunch of different amazing things going on. Uh, on the left hand, we've got a moment to moment transition again. So emphasizing what happens when uh, there is no there's no speech at all. Uh, the use of the swastika on the mouse page is so powerful that imagery of them saying we didn't have anywhere to go and walking on the swastika because the swastika represents the Germans were in every direction. Uh, and then on the third page there uh, from Pride of Baghdad, the juxtaposition between the lions and how small they are set against the huge area of destruction. So showing showing them that the combination of words and pictures is so important and provides so much more than just scaffolding, so much more than just chunking. It's providing this like rich imagery that they can analyze, that they can like find all these things in their classrooms. So many teachers spend all this time analyzing English text, but they don't see that they can do that with graphic novels as well because they just aren't aware of what the possibilities are. Uh, so you have the ability to go in and sort of say like, I can, I can help you. I can help you achieve this. I can help your students achieve more. Uh, and you can give them these tools. So, all right, my advice to you, no program develops overnight. It may take years before you feel like you really know what you're doing or that you have a good school client base. Uh, but if you keep at it, you're going to get new people every year for every librarian who retires who doesn't believe in graphic novels, there's a new librarian starting out who knows that graphic novels are the best thing to put in their libraries. So take this language, start using this language when you're talking to teachers and librarians and even parents, parents will respond to it as well. Find some ways to incentivize students to come into your school, make the connections uh, with schools, with mailers and keep in touch with the newsletter. Um, so for incentivizing students, we talked about, about Comics for Excellence, so that's one program that we do. Um, we also make sure that when Free Comic Book Day and Halloween Comic Fest are coming up that we put that in our newsletter to schools. You might even want to do a straight up mailing to the schools with a poster for Free Comic Book Day uh, that the teacher librarian would put in to their library and hang up uh, for you and, and have them promote it. Teacher librarians are going to be all about promoting that you're giving them free comics. That's amazing. Like, they want kids to read. And so the idea that they, those kids can come to your store and get free comics, the teacher librarian is going to be activated to promote on your behalf. You just have to give them the information to let them know that it's going on. Um, and creating those relationships through uh, regular contact throughout the year is going to be really valuable. All right. Who's got questions for me? I'm ready. So yeah, we do other we do events with other um, other organizations as well. So uh, for example, uh, the there's a variety of neighborhood groups that do after school programs that will have us come in and run game days for them. Uh, and so we do charge them for that. Um, I usually charge them uh, one hundred and fifty dollars for two hours, uh, and that will cover two staff members going down and uh, playing games with kids. You can charge more. I should probably charge more, but I'm a softie for the after school program. So, uh, so yeah, they uh, that gets our staff in and gets kids excited and engaged in playing games and hopefully coming back to the store and checking it out. It's uh, it's all about getting out there and just getting engaging with the community and getting the community to understand that you you want to work with them. So some other things that we do to really like push that mandate is that we choose where we advertise in ways that is conducive for our overall mission. So for example, we advertise at the uh, Ontario Hockey League, which is the minor league hockey team here. We advertise at their games and we give away a kid's prize pack. Uh, we advertise with uh, like soccer teams and put our logo on their jerseys. We advertise by donating uh, prize packs to schools for their auctions. So all of it is putting our name out there to that like school communities so that people know that we are there and so they get to just know the name know where to go for comics and games uh, i do not have coupons for the events i have never found that coupons work um, i've tried them many times 
and the bounce back rate is so low that the effort of putting together the coupon and distributing the coupon becomes just absolutely negligible. <laughs> so, or the, the effort becomes too much to justify the, uh, the bounce back. Um, so yeah, I do not use coupons. Anyone else? As I mentioned before, I'm happy to uh, talk more about any of these sorts of things. Um, I will provide that book list uh, of what we do for book fairs. And yeah, Holly's back. Hey, Holly. Hey. hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, thank, thank you so much, Jennifer. This was fantastic. And thank You're you. Um, <laughs> are there, but well, we, we still have about 15 minutes. Mm, yeah. Left, so uh, we will wait around a little bit and see if anyone has any other For sure. um while we're doing that i am going to uh post wait that's not the thing i want to post i'm going to post in the chat um a link to uh information about how you can support cbldf and become a member if you're not already there we go Oh, and anyway, we have a few, we have a few more. Let's see. Cool. Thanks for all the compliments, guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, you are fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so, yeah, just to remind you to please support us if you are not already a member, um, to become a member. Um, and uh, you will be receiving... Um, the presentation, a certificate saying that you are CBLDF certified for uh, sales to schools and libraries. And um, also the handout, um, Jen said you said you had a list of uh, yep. graphic novels. So we will send all of that to you. Um, be looking for that sometime next week in your emails. And also, um, when this is done, please be sure to take the post-webinar survey that helps us know if we're doing a good job and um, what other topics you might want to, uh, to be included in our future webinars. That will help us out greatly. Um, our next webinar is a Pride webinar. It's Take Pride in Comics, the Challenges Facing LBGTQ Plus Content. And that will be Wednesday, June 12th at 4 p.m. We would love for you to join us for that as well. And let's see. Oh, we have another question though. Yay, we have we have lots of more questions. This is good. <laughs> Um, but just before we get to those, I just wanted to mention uh, that the uh, the ALA annual meeting is coming up. If you have a chance to go to ALA annual, it's uh, it's going to be it's going to be great. I'm running a, a meetup between retailers and librarians at that event. Uh, but also, there's a graphic novel and comic roundtable as part of the ALA, which is basically just a group of people who are interested in promoting graphic novels and, and comics in libraries. It's a really great chance for retailers and librarians to actually uh, meet on a Facebook forum and be able to talk about needs. And I've actually learned a lot about the, um, the needs of libraries that way, uh, which is fantastic because yeah, they have very unique needs throughout the country. Uh, so foreign language comics. Uh, so there's really not a lot out there. Um, there's a lot of French out there if you're if you're into French, but that might be just Canada. <laughs> I think uh, you know, and the difference too is like, is it is Spain Spanish versus like sort of a South American or North, North American Spanish, right? I know that with French, like Quebecois French, is very different from actual France French. Uh, so getting the books that support your actual like language branch of Spanish is, is a challenge inside the greater challenge that there's just not that much out there. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure. I think just keep talking to publishers and mentioning that you have a, a need for that. Uh, and I think it's, it's just going to be one of those things that sort of slowly shifts over time, but it, there's, everything is possible, right? Right? <laughs> uh, events for adults. You know, I don't actually do a lot of events for adults in terms of, uh, of you know the sort of the working with schools and libraries and, and book fair type stuff, uh, I do work with a few organizations for um, 
for adults who need sort of like second chance opportunities or uh, adults who have uh, developmental delays. And we do a lot of work sort of uh, donating books to them and just supporting their events and doing sort of a mutual a mutual support uh, and having, you know, groups come through to do like practice interviews and things like that. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, Royce, hopefully. All right. Cool. Uh, so a resource to find out what good new young adult graphic novels are out. Um, no, I, I, uh, I buy most things. Okay. Sorry. Charles says that some folks are sending questions on LinkedIn. Else. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so the question is, um, sorry, where was I? Sorry about this. No uh, worries. Other than your own experience in seeing what sells at your store, do you have a resource to find what good new young adult graphic novels are out? Uh, I mostly just uh, buy everything that seems to look good, and then I try it out myself. And if it is good, then I will buy more. And if it's not, then I will have regrets. No. <laughs> Eventually, it will go on a sale table. <laughs> It is, uh, it is what it is with sort of like any comics, you know, you, you sort of decide, um, you sort of decide what it is that you want to, that you will think will work for your customers and you take a gamble on it and then you check it out. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's just, it's kind of the same. There are certain publishers that you can kind of like say are go-to publishers for great uh, all ages and YA books, um, you know, Random House for second, uh, Boom, Lion Forge, like all these companies have fantastic and Scholastic, obviously Scholastic's like the big behemoth. Um, and so working with those publishers, you can kind of feel confident that those books are going to fit really well. Uh, and then taking a little bit of risk on some other stuff as well. Andrews McNeil, that's another good one as well. Uh, I have uh, tried to have events where I invited librarians to my shop. Uh, so that's one of the things where I think that if I was going to um, do it repeatedly over time, then it might gain more traction, but it didn't really work the way I wanted it to. So the first year I did like a set time of come to the store and let's, let's meet and let's talk about the stuff and let's do a talk. The second year that I tried it, I did instead an open house and just said like, this is a day that I'm going to be at the store for a couple of days. You come in, come on in, we can have one-on-one -on -one talks. Uh, and we can we can see what will work for you. But for the most part, they want me to come to them, which is better, to be honest, because I kind of need to see what's in their collection. I kind of need to see what's going on. I need to see how uh, how dog eared some of the books are uh, so I can see what's turning better for them. Uh, and I need to see how many how much of their collection is like old remnants of when there weren't a lot of graphic novels. And so whatever they could get is what's on their shelf. So I don't know how many of you have been into schools and know what I'm talking about, but there, before graphic novels for kids became a real thing, there were certain companies that just put out whatever they could as graphic novels. And so librarians bought all of them because they're graphic novels. And most of them are educational but they're horribly boring and often they're not well drawn. And so there's tons of these sitting on school shelves collecting dust and you can really see where it's an old school librarian who did that. And then you have a new school librarian coming in who's like, I want to do it differently and getting a feel for that and getting a feel for the vibe of the library is actually really important for me in trying to help them get their collection. I also spy on the kids to see what they're reading because that's good too. <laughs> uh, we donate a percent of school sales back to school PTAs for secret shopping days. Have you done that instead of offering books and games? Have you found that offering product brings more sales? Uh, so I do offer the chance for schools to come in and do the uh, school shopping days. However, I have not had success uh, gaining traction with that. This is the first year I offered it. Um, I will probably uh verbally talk about it with uh, teachers, with librarians next year. Uh, as I go around and uh, talk to them and do the consultations, I will talk to them more about that particular option for them uh, because it's, it's very like low maintenance for them. All right, 
Yeah. yeah. Everyone should read Brian Hibbs analysis of the all ages books. Uh, Cause it's really great sales data. Um, have I had backlash from teachers or students at any of my events? Uh, I have not with one exception. It was a teacher presentation I did many years ago. Um, it was in a Catholic school board and one of the books I used was V for Vendetta. And that was the school board's decision that they chose that book. Uh, however, one teacher started flipping through it and then started flipping out. So, <laughs> it was super fun. Uh, I didn't get a lot of uh, really good constructive work done at that particular workshop, which was very unfortunate um, because they got caught up in that instead of in what I could teach them. And there was also another teacher in that workshop who thought that I should just give her all of the, I should, I should basically design her lesson plans. But as every teacher knows, uh, your lesson plans are going to be really dependent on who's in your class. And your lesson plans are going to change based on who's in your class. And they're often going to change uh, even while you're teaching the class from what you thought you were going to do. Uh, so what I did for the flip out was I, uh, so I was asked, how did you handle the flip out? How would you recommend folks handle such a flip out? So what I pointed out was that the, the scene that they took issue with was while taken in isolation, was the thing that caused them the affront. But when taken in the context of the book, it works perfectly in the context of the book. And it's justified. It's not there for sensational means. It's there as part of the character arc of that character. It's there to drive the story in a way that is intrinsic to what's going on with the character. So it's not just a plot device. It's not just there to be shocking. It's not just there to be critical of the Catholic Church, but it's there because it is intrinsic to the development of that character and her journey throughout the book. So, yeah, I think just staying calm and explaining that it's not just in there because explaining the value of the book, explaining that this is part of uh, that. This book is extremely valuable. It is award-winning uh, and it is that that particular scene is not sensationalism. It's there because it is a, an intrinsic part of the story. <laughs> what do I, what's my opinion on people who claim they know the character and they've only seen the movie? So in terms of knowing uh, the Evie character from seeing V for Vendetta, I think it would be basically you're saying, okay, so you're basically in that particular context, it's important to point out that the comics and the movie medium are two different things. And just as when adapting a prose novel to a movie, you end up with a very different product at the end. It's the same with adapting a graphic novel to a movie. And even though comics kind of lend themselves naturally to this, to being movies, because they're basically storyboarded, uh, there's still things that you can't do in a movie that you can do in a comic, for example. And so there's going to be choices that are made in both media that make sense for that medium. And also that makes sense for the time period in which they're created. Like in V for Vendetta, for example, uh, it didn't make as much sense in the time period that it was created in. So they made certain adjustments that maybe were not as, were not as, you know, we're not true to the original source material, but still worked in a different way. Doing a movie uh, and graphic novel comparison project is a great one. It's really a fantastic uh, project so that students can see how uh, the, each medium is distinct and how they can relate to each other, but they do their own thing. We have several sources um, on our website as well that um, can help you handle flip outs. Uh, <laughs> um, so one, one in particular, um, adding graphic novels to your library or classroom collection is going to provide you with um, a synopsis um, and other um, uh, critiques of the source that uh, will help you defend it as well. Just as Jen was saying, this, the same things that she was saying about uh, V for Vendetta. There's a whole list of, um, of uh, books that have been um, challenged and it gives you a way to defend those. The language you need to defend those, yeah. Cool. We have about two minutes left. Yeah. Yeah, I would just I would just reiterate when talking with when working with librarians about their collection, um, you definitely want to be respectful of the collection, respectful of their limitations, respectful of their budget, um, and respectful of the fact that they have ideas about what they want in their library. Uh, but 
also keep in mind that you are the expert and not to just take their list and decide that that's all they need. Talk to them about their list. Talk to them about what they want and need. Talk to them about, you know, if this, if your goal is to get kids reading books, I'm not sure these books are the ones you want. Here's some other books that I think would be fantastic. Uh, I got have a question here. Do you bring less scholastic books, seeing as scholastic does work with schools already and host their own book fairs? You know what? I thought that, that was going to be a problem. And I, I actually see more sales with scholastic books than with the non-scholastic books. Um, scholastic is just a behemoth. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it sells constantly, no matter where or when you are. And so, uh, yeah, I definitely still take scholastic and I see it keep selling because I think that kids are just, they're familiar with it. They know it. They love it. They want to buy it. Um, is there a book or series that when you ask students for suggestions comes up the most? Huh. No, I don't think that there necessarily is. Yeah, probably Dogman. <laughs> um, and uh, it's usually, it's actually really varied because um, it's usually stuff that I haven't put in a library already or somebody else hasn't gotten there and put, and put in the library. So it's usually something really outside the box. Like I had a school recently re request Maximum Ride and I was like, I haven't sold a Maximum Ride book in like five years. I don't even understand. Uh, so it's, it's definitely all over the map. Um, but there are certain series that are like go-tos like Amulet, obviously, uh, the Reina, the Dogman. Um, and then, you know, there's certain manga series like Naruto, Zelda, um, Full Metal Alchemist that are just perennial go-tos to put in libraries because kids always are always looking for them. So. Um, there was also a question, it said, do you ever do programs with public libraries or only school libraries? And if you do, like, what, how would you address, how would, how would that uh, be different? So I do not do programs with my public library. Uh, they... Um, they do buy single issue comics from us, but they have some sort of like super archaic deal with a bookseller that they okay. can't break for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, so even though I know, I know more uh, about what I'm doing, um, they have, they're, they're being, they're being rigid basically. Okay. Eventually, eventually I'm sure I can break them down. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's for me, schools were just an easy opening um, because they don't have the same, they don't have the same thing in place. They're, they are individual people who are looking for ways to reach their students and help their students on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not the same as a government organization that has a particular structure and mandate and board and things like that. I am gonna post a, regarding that as well. Um, mm. There is a resource. It's It was created for comics creators, but it's also useful yeah. for retailers because it talks about the difference between different types of libraries and how to navigate them. Awesome. All right. Well, guys, it is two minutes over. I want to thank you again for attending. I hope you all have a beautiful day. Thank you again, Jennifer, for being our presentator, oh, our presenter for today. Joining me. I, hope, uh, I hope you all got something out of it, and I will hopefully meet you for the first time or again sometime soon. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Everyone have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you.